Okay, yeah, I, I got it. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, as I said, um, my name's Nate and I'm an intern for the town of Chapel Hill. Um, and so we're doing this um, in partnership with the Residence Hall Association on campus. So shout out to them. Um, and so first we're going to start this off with a presentation from uh, Blair Count or Blair Pollock, who is from the Orange County Solid Waste Department. He has been working there for over 30 years as um, the solid waste planner. Um, and we are going to follow that with a presentation by Kira Laveau, who works for um, the county. And she also works in the solid waste department as the recycling education and outreach coordinator. So I will turn it over to Blair. Um, his presentation. Thank you, Nate. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and I guess uh, you, you're going to run my slides. So that's the last one. So uh, however that's set up. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, before I actually uh, do the presentation, I want to do about a two minute history. So uh, that that got me engaged in this. The Orange County and the town of Chapel Hill and Carver got together in 1972 in the wake of UNC closing its landfill, which is in the middle of Carolina North, and um, bought land out on Eubanks Road to build a landfill. So um, at that point in history, Eubanks Road was all dirt and it was a very uh, sparsely settled part of, uh, of Northern Chapel Hill slash Orange County, but there was a community, uh, historic black community had been uh, adjoining in the Rogers Road neighborhood since the uh, Civil War era um, enabled black people to buy land here. So the, the landfill was, um, was, was put out on Eubanks and uh, in 1984, they said, oh gee, we have to start looking for a new landfill because it'll fill up eventually. Some land was for sale nearby, again, adjoining the same community. So there was a, a, a strained relationship when it became clear that the county and the town of Chapel Hill voted to buy this piece of land that called the Green Tract, uh, owned by the Green family, as the next landfill possibility. So um, <clears throat> uh, any number, large number of people showed up in Carborough to uh, speak against buying that land for a landfill. When I spoke, I said, well, if you're gonna site a landfill, you really ought to start a recycling program to reduce waste. You should look at alternative technologies and you should have a more measured landfill site search that gets a piece of land that's ge geologically suitable for a landfill as opposed to just buying a piece of land. So a short two years later, the Orange County Solid Waste Task Force that I got appointed to um, turned in a report to the county and the towns that said the long version of those three sentences. You should start a recycling program, look at other technologies and have a more measured landfill site search. The town of Chapel Hill that managed that uh, landfill at the time turned around and hired a recycling coordinator. I applied for the job and got it. So kind of wrote my own ticket in a weird kind of way. And I've been there since then working on uh, how to reduce waste to landfill. Um, the landfill that we own closed in 2013 and we've been shipping garbage to Sampson County, or, or our municipal solid waste MSW to Sampson County um, to a mega landfill that uh, a private company owns there ever since. So the garbage goes from, let's say you're in Chapel Hill or at UNC, the garbage is picked up by a private company, was called Waste Industries, now Green for Life. It goes to a transfer stations where it's packed into uh, 22 and 23 tons at a time in a tractor trailer and goes down I-40 uh, to the landfill in Sampson County. So over a hundred miles each way uh, to get your, get rid of our garbage now. So some people say out of sight, out of mind, and other people say, no, it's still our problem and our issue. So we continue to toil and look for ways to reduce the amount of garbage going to landfill. And a lot of people in recent past have come to talk about this as materials management rather than solid waste management, because really most so-called trash is just materials that are out of place or underutilized. And tonight's program, I'm gonna to talk specifically about composting um, as, as, a, as a much, as a superior way to deal with organic waste um, rather than landfilling it. So you can go on to the next slide. 
So um, we did a we do a waste composition study about every five years, and um, it ascertained in the last one in 2017, 18 that uh, almost half of our garbage is um, compostable. That is, um, about 25% of our garbage is food waste, and another 22% or so is other kinds of compostable waste: wet paper towels, uh, you know, um, leather. Um, the small amount of yard waste that ends up in waste cans and so on. So we don't need to invent any new technologies to manage this. It's all manageable with uh, current, uh, very effective and sophisticated composting technology. Next slide. So you'll see this slide again when Kira speaks, but it just gives you a bit of an idea. Um, if you focus on the uh, the red 10%, the green 47%, and the orangey uh, 22%, you can quickly realize that if everybody did everything they could with no new technologies, no fancy plasma torch, no waste combustion system, we could manage the, um, the vast majority of the waste that's generated in Orange County. So again, you know, looking at the pie there, 47% of it is compostable, um, meaning in a large industrial composting system, not necessarily backyard. Okay, next slide. So why bother with composting? Well, you know, as we spoke about, we want to reduce the amount of waste that we're sending out of county and spending a lot of carbon getting it there. And then one of the ironies of that is once that uh, food waste is in the ground, rotting away or uh, anaerobic bacteria, use it as food, but instead of belching out um, conventional CO2 and water, they, bent, they belch out CH4 methane. And so <clears throat> by today's calculation, um, I, I meant to write 80 times more potent than CO2 in the short run, not 80% more. Uh, the calculation used to be 23 times more potent. And um, because of the uh, climate emergency, the short run that makes it, um, 80, 80 times as potent as a, a ton of CO2 and trapping greenhouse gases <clears throat> over the next 20 years. Over time, that uh, the, the atmosphere of chemistry changes, but um, landfills alone, uh, according to EPA, account for 15% of US methane emissions. Um, and then, you know, the third benefit is that, particularly in the Piedmont of North Carolina, we've got uh, plenty of water, plenty of sunlight, a mild climate. What we lack is healthy soil. We didn't get the glacier, so unlike a lot of the rest of the country, we have pretty thin soils. And then um, when, uh, when, when cultivation of, co of cotton, tobacco, and corn began um, in the early 1800s in a big way, we pretty much destroyed whatever soil was left in most of the Piedmont. So um, rebuilding the soil is a, a major task for us and it has the side benefit of being able to sequester additional carbon. Okay, next slide. So uh, we closed, as I mentioned, uh, the north side of the landfill in 95, the south side in 2013. And interestingly enough, when we first closed the north side of the landfill in, in 1995, the university and, and the county and the town said, well, we know that uh, methane is gonna come out of that landfill, but it's really not cost effective to run a four mile pipeline from the clean up the gas and run a four mile pipeline to the UNC power plant, which is the only large potential industrial user and all the other ways of using methane, cleaning it up for pipeline gas or cleaning it up for a, a, a fuel for trucks, et cetera, weren't nearly sophisticated enough to be considered. So the, the straight up economics of, of converting uh, the methane to a fuel at the coal plant didn't really pan out. And um, what drove the, the decision forward was UNC's decision under Chancellor Thorpe some years back to become carbon neutral. So it wasn't really the straight up economics of methane um, going to a pipeline or substituting for coal. It was when UNC made a policy decision that, okay, we're going to go put carbon neutral. And some part of that can be t capturing that methane and destroying it at first and then putting it eventually in a turbine um, to, to make electricity. So that's been going on for a while, but it was a five and a half million dollar investment. And it's important to understand the policy drivers. And so, so Nate and Hannah, economics and public policy majors, are you listening? Um, 
anyway, uh, the gas after t after 15 years of producing it is now, or well, it's it's been coming out for years, but um, gas production is now starting to go down. So after another 10 years, the site will be stabilized, and we can look at other uses for the land. Okay, next slide. So um, just go back one, please. I just wanted to show real, oh, I don't know what's happening there. I wanted to show a quick schematic, there you go, of sort of how this works. And so if you just follow the flow on a horizontal basis, you'll see kind of what is happening. Um, we suck the gas out of the land or the, the UNC um, built system sucks the gas out of the landfill. It treats it because it's only 50% methane and it sends it to an industrial generator that then makes electricity. It could have been vehicle fuel. It could have uh, been put into a pipeline if it had made pipeline quality, but that's kind of the schematic of how these things work. Okay, proceed. But rather than trying to take the cream out of the coffee, um, we decided a, a good strategy would be to look at ways to reduce the amount of food waste going to landfill as part of our overall strategy to reduce garbage uh, in Orange County. The county set a 61% um, um, waste reduction goal back in 1996. So again, a lot of the measures that we took to get there were policy driven versus the, the relatively low cost of landfilling. So that policy the driver of uh, all three governments that own the landfill, Chapel Hill, Carborough, and Hillsborough, I mean, Chapel Hill, Carborough, and Orange County together in, adopted and endorsed this goal um, to make a 61% reduction in the amount of garbage that we landfill per person. So one of the elements of that was to set up a food waste diversion program from, you know, not individual households, but larger restaurants and so on. And so initially we included UNC and grocery stores and, and um, UNC hospital and so on. And over the uh, starting in, in 2017, we began, we, we notified people like Whole Foods and UNC hospital that they were going to not be subsidized anymore. UNC itself had uh, begun paying for the, its own food waste collection in 2008 when they stopped bringing waste to the landfill. So there was sort of a quid pro quo that they promised waste to us, which we made money off of. And at the same time they got, free, if you will, food waste collection. So food waste collection has continued at UNC pretty robustly and strongly, and it's a great successful program at the cafeterias there. So um, we have a mix of small restaurants, nonprofits, and uh, some churches that you'll hear from later. So go on to the next slide. So a little bit of a snapshot uh, shows you kind of a mix I put an asterisk because it's too complicated to get at the statistics from any one given year, but our program is now diverting less, you know, around 800 tons a year, pre-COVID anyway. UNC, uh, UNC Hospital is a big generator. The city schools have adopted a program and large known private generators like uh, Whole Foods and Weaver Street Market and um, a bunch of the big hotels have all adopted the program on their own now. So we're aware of about 3,200 tons and there remains another 11,300 tons of organics in the commercial part of the waste stream. So, you know, when you start to think about solid waste planning, what's realistic in terms of how much of that could we capture? And so I just, you know, wanted you to think about what's possible if we've already captured, pardon the pun, the low hanging fruit. Okay, go on. So in addition, people don't think about this much, but uh, the yard waste that goes to the landfill as a consequence of a 1993 North Carolina law that said you can no longer landfill yard waste. So that accounts for a huge chunk of organics that aren't landfilled. And then when I use the word recirculated, what I mean there is that if you live in a single family house in Chapel Hill, you can call the public works department and say, I'd like a load of leaves, please. And then you leave them in the side yard for a year and you've got some terrific um, nutrient rich uh, composted leaf mold and Hillsborough and Carver do similar programs. So we, we, when we think about organics, a lot of that material that's collected weekly or so from the curb and then vacuum trucks in the winter contribute to this sort of carbon sequestration that we experience. 
There's a lot of other efforts that we don't know that much about to be able to quantify. Um, go ahead. So, you know, what happens to all this stuff? A windrow is the simplest, least uh, sophisticated technology, a long, maybe eight, 10 foot high pile that can be hundreds of feet long that's turned periodically. We use that for managing yard waste, ground up yard waste at the landfill. It's what Brooks, our contractor uses. Another composter, successful large composter in Southern Chatham, McGill, uses a, a method that's much less land intensive, but more capital intensive. So they, they put all the compostable material in a big building, if you will, and, and push air through it until it reaches temperature. And then uh, in vessel is yet a more sophisticated, more accelerated version of that. And then you've also got anaerobic digestion, which you know, I talked about earlier, except for the bacteria are concentrated in a vessel and you pull the methane off of that instead of, you know, the compost, you get most of the carbon going off as methane, and then you get what's called the digestate, which is the remainder um, to uh, send off for, for a, a soil amendment. There's one big one in Charlotte, Blue Sphere, that's taking a lot of uh, compostable food waste there, and the most wastewater treatment plants use a similar technology, and there's been some fits and starts at trying to integrate food waste into wastewater plants, but there's a lot of nuance that hasn't allowed that to be as sophisticated as it might without huge uh, investment. And we're way too small for that. Go ahead. So, um, you know, all this potential to do work in Orange County uh, on organics is part of a larger construct of a solid waste plan. So the county has just received a bunch of proposals from different consultants to help us do our solid waste plan to uh, it's stipulated to achieve an 80% reduction in waste to landfills in the next 25 years. So given that 47% uh, of our waste is, <clears throat> excuse me, organics, uh, what to do with that? So just some ideas here. Uh, mandatory commercial uh, composting has been introduced in Massachusetts, Connecticut, California. So if you make over um, two tons of uh, of, garb of compostables a week, 100 tons a year, you're subjected to the law in Massachusetts, for example, that says you have to have a plan to reduce your organics, whether it's composting or, you know, um, reimagining re food waste, et cetera. And I see my friend Greg Overbeck in the background, and he's, he's a, uh, um, to use the hackneyed term, but it's true for Greg, he's real, he and his restaurants are real rock stars in terms of adopting uh, this kind of waste reduction. Uh, anyway, that law, uh, that bill has been introduced by Representative Hawkins, uh, HB 1119. And uh, you may wanna follow that if you're interested in this. And so to make a disclaimer, these last few bullets are just thoughts of mine about how we might move forward. Do we expand the current commercial program that's mostly targeted smaller restaurants and food waste generators using more public funds? Do we mandate, uh, as we did years ago, commercial food collection and back away from participating in it? Do we reduce the county's um, you know, potential uh, uh, expenditure by cost sharing with uh, restaurants and, and churches and so on? Do we start residential curbside program for food waste? And when I say fourth truck, so there's already a truck coming down your street every week to get your trash, a truck every week for your brush, and a truck every week for your recycling, plus a random truck every now and then for bulky items. So, you know, if it's all about the carbon, do we want to introduce another truck? Um, do we consider residential collection sites? And Kira will talk more about that. Promote more backyard. What do we do in apartment complexes? Uh, are hundreds of people going to do their food waste collection properly? And so, uh, as part of the planning process in our community, there'll be a major set of opportunities for public input. And so I hope you all will stay tuned for that. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, um, Blair, for sharing that. Um, that was really wonderful. And so now we are going to have um, Kira from Orange County Solid Waste. To, she's the Recycling Education and Outreach Coordinator. Um, she's going to give a quick presentation. Um, so take it away. Thank you. Let me share my screen.
Can you guys see that? All right, great. All right, so like Nate said, I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator for Orange County Solid Waste, and I'll be covering um, the composting programs that we offer in Orange County, um, how we've engaged with residents and communities, um, and then some public engagement that we do with composting. So I know Blair touched a little bit on the program history, um, but to go more in depth, we started back in 1990 at 11 schools that had community gardens and they started composting. Um, and then Blair gave me an extra tidbit yesterday um, about hog farmers. Um, we started with two small um, hog farmers that fed a lot of the food waste to their hogs. Um, and that's how it started on a small scale. So that's a fun fact. Um, and then in 1999, the program expanded to businesses. So now we have roughly over 50 restaurants and businesses on our program in Orange County. And then um, we got the Carborough Farmers Market on board in 2016. So they have a food waste collection drop off site at the market on Saturdays. Um, by the end of 2018, we kicked off some large food waste generators. So those that were producing over 100 tons um, a year were removed from the program in order for us to be able to um, focus on offering this program to smaller and local businesses in the county. And then in late 2019, we piloted a residential food waste collection um, at a condo complex in Chapel Hill. And I'll go into more detail about that later on. So in Orange County, we have three food waste collection locations. Two of them are at our waste and recycling centers, one at Eubanks Road, the other at Walnut Grove Church Road. And then that third one is at the Carborough Farmers Market, as I mentioned. Any Orange County resident is allowed to attend any of these collection sites for free. Um, the Carborough Farmers Market is open to any market goer. Anyone that goes to the market can take their food waste there. And all of the food waste collected at these three locations is sent to an industrial composting facility called Brooks Contractor, and they're located in Goldston, North Carolina. So the Carborough Farmers Market is by far our most popular drop-off site. Um, it's only open um, on Saturdays during their market hours. Um, and in 2019, we were able to collect a total of 34 tons of food waste. Um, and we see roughly around 160 people come by each Saturday to drop off their food waste. Um, there are monitors present each Saturday to answer any questions that people may have about if a material is compostable or not, um, or how to get started, or um, any general program questions about if they can bring their food waste or um, what any restrictions may be or any questions about contamination, the monitors really help make sure that we're sending clean compost to Brooks. Um, we previously managed the compost monitors at the farmer's market and we recently turned it over into the hands of um, the Carborough Parks and Rec department. So now they have um, at least two monitors present at the markets on Saturdays. The other two are at our waste and recycling centers. Um, so in fiscal year 18-19, we saw a total of 23.2 tons. So as you can see here, not as popular as the Carborough Farmers Market drop off, um, even though this is the combined tonnage for both of the food waste collection locations. Um, th this also is open for six days out of the week. Um, so a lot more potential for people to drop off their food waste and open for more hours as well. In exciting news, um, because we know that the Carborough Farmers Market is such a popular location, we decided um, that it should also be added to the other two markets in Orange County. So we are in the works of adding it to the Chapel Hill Farmers Market and the Eno River Farmers Market, which is in Hillsborough, North Carolina. Um, I believe the Chapel Hill Farmers Market is planning to um, have their compost collection open on Earth Day. And then the Eno River Farmers Market is gonna launch on May 1st. So very soon, very exciting. And we're trying to get the word out to uh, people that live in Chapel Hill and Hillsborough about the new um, collection sites. 
So you guys are some of the first to know. Feel very lucky. And then to go over our residential food waste collection program, this was piloted um, back in 2019, I believe the start of 2019 at Kirkwood Townhomes in Chapel Hill. Um, residents there spearheaded the program I um, mean, they got about half of the residents in Kirkwood to participate. So 52 out of the 109 households that they have, they approached their HOA um, to be able to get their approval, get them on board and also purchase 50 kitchen top compost bins from us to be able to provide their residents with. Any resident that wanted to participate in the program had to sign a pledge that they would compost correctly, not include any contaminants in the carts, um, you know, follow the rules, understand what could and couldn't be composted. Um, they also received the free bin from their HOA and a finished bag of compost as motivation to what they were working towards. So the Kirkwood community is able to divert 1,700 pounds of food waste um, each month through the program. And I spoke to a resident there a few weeks ago and actually they believe they have more than um, 52 households participating now, so those numbers may be a little higher. Um, in November of 2020, we collected some data on the amount of waste that they were generating in their community and compared it to the same period last year before they had the composting program started. And in the first week, we saw a 38% reduction in waste, and the second week, we saw a 61% reduction in waste. So while this seems um, like obvious that you would have less waste to the landfill while you're composting. Um, factors like COVID could have impacted the amount of waste they were generating. And um, overall, you always want to see uh, a significant decrease in the amount of waste to landfill when you start a composting program somewhere. So we're happy to see those numbers. We've also offered some composting 101 workshops. Um, Pre-pandemic, this was actually the first week uh, that I started working at Orange County. We held a composting 101 workshop in person, uh, which seems kind of crazy, but it was really exciting. This is the site in the picture here that we have um, at our office off of Eubanks Road. It's a little composting demonstration site. Um, and while we haven't been able to offer any in-person workshops, I've been hosting a lot of composting 101 webinars. Um, that's open to anyone in the public. And those have been really popular. People have been very excited to learn about composting and how to get started in their backyard. Um, and even if they didn't want to necessarily start backyard composting, they were excited to learn about the other options available to them, such as our drop-off sites or um, starting a local pickup service like Compost Now. Those were really popular. Um, I went over the general composting basics um, and what we can and cannot accept in our program. And then um, also encouraged people to um, buy an earth machine from Orange County. So we sell earth machines and um, kitchen top bins. We were also able to collaborate with a lot of other organizations and neighborhoods. Um, over the past year, we held workshops with um, the North Carolina Botanical Gardens. This workshop was similar to my composting 101, but um, tied more into the gardening aspect of things because those two um, can work very well together. You can compost, get your finished compost or your black gold. I know some people love to call it, and that is um, your garden's best friend. Um, your garden will be very happy if you have compost in it. Um, in the workshop we had in person, we partnered with the Orange County Master Gardeners. We've also, or I've also given some neighborhood specific webinars. So we've had neighborhoods that have a community garden reach out to us and ask us about help they've needed, um, whether they've just wanted to troubleshoot some of the issues they've had at their backyard composting site at their community garden, or they want to start a composting site at the community garden. I was um, able to help out and give webinars to specific neighborhood groups. And then other organizations like the Climate Reality, Orange County Chapter, the Sierra Club, um, and then UNC's Environmental Education has an Outdoor Wonder and Learning Program, which is where 
teachers um, learn about a specific subject and take that information and then reiterate it to their kids. So for Earth Month, I was able to give a presentation to teachers about recycling and composting in Orange County. These are the bins I was talking about. Um, we sell the backyard composter, which is an earth machine. It's a static composter. Um, and then a kitchen top compost bin. Uh, if you're interested or know someone that may be interested or in the market for a new backyard composter or bin, um, you can purchase these at the Scale House um, located on Eubanks Road by appointment only on Wednesdays. You can call or email our office um, to set that up. This is my contact information um, and then the department's contact information in case you have any questions um, moving forward or if you ever think of a random recycling or composting question in a few weeks from now and want to ask me. Thank you so much for that, Kira. That was amazing. Yes. Um, our next speaker is John Richardson. He works for the town of Chapel Hill as a community resilience officer, and he is also Nate and I's one of our supervisors. Um, he's great. He was behind the town's climate action plan, and he's here to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I'll be brief because I know uh, y'all want to get back to, to learning about compost, but I just wanted to share real, real quickly for anybody, as Hannah just mentioned, who may be interested uh, on April 7th, the town council did uh, adopt the town's climate action and response plan. Uh, and this can be found at sustainchapelhill.org. I'll put the link in the chat in a second. Um, the plan puts us on a path to reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, and so it's really a, a plan to help us reduce the impacts of climate change, but also um, you know, to begin adapting uh, to our change, a changing climate as well. Um, it's also, uh, we view uh, climate action, of course, as doing things beyond just dealing with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the plan highlights that, you know, if we take these steps, um, it's, it's about other things too. It can be about improving uh, public and environmental health, uh, advancing racial equity and upholding environmental justice, uh, strengthening local and regional partnerships, creating jobs, uh, preferably uh, in the sustainable economy realm and also building resilience. So um, within that plan, there is a goal to uh, reduce our waste significantly as Blair mentioned from the outset. So uh, what's nice is that our plan is aligned with um, some of what Blair described as far as next steps for creating a solid waste master plan in Orange County uh, of which we will be a part of that. So. You know, I think solid waste is a great example, as, as Blair and Kira have already mentioned, of, of an environmental issue in, in Orange County that is going to take all of us working together uh, to, to reach our goals uh, collectively. Uh, and so, I, again, I want to thank Blair and Kira for, for being here and helping to frame that, that conversation in that context. I also want to thank Hannah and Nate for organizing a great event today. Uh, and just to say thank you all for your interest and, and for joining us as well. So I'll turn it back over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Um, yeah, he'll put that information in the chat. So do check that out. Um, next, we're gonna go into our panel discussion. Um, we're gonna start by having all of our panelists kind of introduce yourself and your work, um, why you got into composting, where you started and where you are now. Um, so whoever wants to start can kind of go ahead. Okay, I guess we can start. <laughs> um, I'm Karen and this is Linda and we are from Binkley Church and we are the former owners of Spotted Dog in uh, Carborough. We opened the restaurant in 1998. Some people, and I forgot to mention, some people know us as trashy women uh, because we do a lot of trash talking um, to a lot of churches and um, anybody who will listen pretty much. But um, we were one of the first people that got on the Orange County, not first, but in 1999, we were part of the Orange County um, composting um, uh, organics, waste. organics waste program. And prior to that, we were, Farmer John was picking up our compost and feeding it to, you know, to his 
farms. So, um, and we worked with Blair for many, many years. So when we went to Binkley, um, we were asked to be part of uh, Wednesday night dinners. And so composting has always been um, at the forefront for us. So we started bringing a bucket uh, and, you know, collecting organics and um, slowly starting to switch away from, you know, single use items and things like that. And, um, you know, uh, the church got excited environmental, I mean, our, our Earth Ministries Committee got excited and they want us to get the whole church on board. And so we really started down this path of how can we get the church, um, how can we create a system um, to collect, you know, the compost. And we really had to start at the basics of recycling um, to, because it was a mess. So we really implemented um, a triple stream waste diversion program at Binkley. Um, we have two preschools, we have over 30 user groups that use the church, so we had to have some um, education uh, information series. Um, we had to, actually the whole church agreed to um, a proclamation of sustainability where the church, um, you know, agrees to try to limit our carbon, carbon footprint. And as a result of the work that Earth Ministries is, has done, there was a couple of groups that popped up that deal with the faith communities. One is the Interfaith Creation Care of the Triangle, ICCT, um, and the other is the Orange Chatham Interfaith Creation Care. And uh, we've done presentations to both of those groups, um, and we've spoken to about um, 25 to 30 faith organizations um, in the triangle. Uh, we've spoken to life um, uh, residential, like long um, plan communities, long plan communities stuff. so retirement communities and things like that, um, Carol Woods, um, Galloway Ridge. And, um, you know, we, we sort of always done it from the ground up. So we try to get people excited around um, waste diversion, if you can uh, imagine that. So we have a lot of fun with um, doing that. And we've, We've enjoyed, and somebody at church gave us the name Trashy Women. So in case anyone wonders where that, that ever comes from, it was from a church. So, um, but um, Linda wanted me to share some of our diversion numbers. We started composting in 2018 uh, in May with just basically the preschool. Um, and here, go ahead and share that part. Um, we started in May of 2018 and with two preschools. And we also used to house Meals on Wheels another uh, big source of uh, food waste uh, for us. But we did 10.03 tons in that year. And then 2019, we almost hit 26 tons of waste that we were able to divert from the landfill, which is pretty significant for a small church. Um, and in 2020, we were really on uh, cue to do about 32 tons, but with COVID that changed things a bit, which is both good and bad. Um, but we diverted about 11 tons in 2020 and right now, with our preschools closed down and just kind of starting back up, we're just doing um, a little less than a ton a month. And I hope that we'll get back up. Um, it's kind of hard to hope for waste, but I do want to continue to be part of the organics waste program. Yeah. Um, but we've also been able to significantly change the culture around waste and not just at Binkley and not just at other Christian churches, mm -hmm. but a lot of diff different faith communities. And Karen didn't tell you, but we work with a lot of POAs and um, HOAs, homeowners associations. And uh, we've kind of opened the lines to get phone calls and emails and texts from people. So we just got a text last night um, from somebody we didn't even know. We just put our number out there when they have recycling or composting questions. Um, we're just kind of another place where people can reach out and they'll shoot us pictures or ask questions. Um, so uh, we feel like we've been able to change the culture in our part of town and also in the triangle. And we do a big shout out to Blair. Yes. Um, because Blair has uh, been our mentor since 1998 when we were working with Farmer John at Spotted Dog. Um, and he's been super patient with us and very teaching. And uh, also Muriel Willoughby, who we used to work with. But uh, we, uh, we've we learned a lot over the years and we continue to learn. So Blair, you're the rock star. We would just like to point that out. <laughs> Thanks. And thank you. Agreed. That was awesome. Sounds like you guys are doing some great things there. Um, Greg, I see you're unmuted. Do you want to go next? Well, you know, there's a lot of folks. We started with Blair, too. He approached us um, many, many years ago about uh, diverting our waste. And at first in the restaurant, oh, there I go. My back? Okay. Uh, you know, in the restaurant business, it can be a little worrisome because there's time involved and space involved, which are our two biggest concerns. But we found that it was very easy to 
you know, collect our food waste in the kitchen. We just put containers in the kitchens. We had at the dishwashing areas, we set up containers for the servers to scrape stuff into. Um, it was really painless and it obviously helped that Orange County underwrote this. Um, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, my apologies for joining uh, a little late. We had a little emergency out in the RTP at one of our restaurants and uh, I got delayed, but uh, you know, we chose out, out at uh, Mez and Pedro Grill to go ahead and pay uh, because Durham County doesn't underwrite these things, but we wanted to do the right thing like a lot of people do. And we decided to pay to, uh, Brooks to come pick up our food waste. Um, you know, obviously this last year has been difficult. We haven't produced as much waste because we're not doing nearly as much business. But what we found was that even though at first it seemed like a daunting preposition to separate food waste, it was very easy and it became part of our training program. And, you know, I, I don't understand. The only possible excuse I could think of for restaurants is a space concern. But, you know, if you want to do it, you can do it. Um, that's really the way it is. There's always space that can be created to, to do this sort of thing. And the staff buys into it. You know, they like what we're doing. They, they, they feel good about the company doing it. So it's been a win, 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 win. And, and once again, Blair is a big part of why this happens. So thanks to him. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Kat, would you like to go next to talk about compost now? Of course, Greg, I used to work out 411 in college. So uh, thanks for getting me through college. <laughs> Appreciate it. You bet. Our um, thank you. <laughs> so hi, y'all. Thanks for uh, such a great presentation thus far. Um, I'm Kat, I'm the VP of Experience at Compost Now. I have been a part of the community composting movement for over five years now. At first, I was a general manager at Tilthy Rich Compost, which was a bike powered compost service in Durham. And then we joined forces with Compost Now and I've been there for the last four years. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about the business model or the logistics model of compost now because it is community scale and I think it's kind of an interesting model. Um, so compost now is a collection service who empower uh, community members and local businesses to divert their compostables from the landfill and instead use them to build healthy soil by composting. Um, so quick disclaimer. We are not the only way to compost, clearly. Um, there's so many different ways, whether you're uh, doing in the backyard, doing vermicomposting, a community drop-off, a public-private partnership, municipal composting, community composting service like ours, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you're composting and it's gonna take a mix of all of those types of systems to truly tackle the large challenge of food waste and our depleted soils. So just want to start with that because this is not a campaign for everybody to be Compost Now members. Um, but with that being said, uh, Compost Now, we started in 2011 in Raleigh. Um, our founder was living in an apartment complex. Um, he was a graphic designer, had no sustainability background, but really wanted to compost. Um, he knew it was the right thing to do, but didn't know how, um, was living in an apartment, so didn't have the space. Um, and he kind of looked around Raleigh is quickly developing and said, I can't be the only person that feels this way. And so that's kind of how we came to be with this idea of people want to do good for the environment. They just need an easy way to do that. Um, they need a path forward. And so when we were building this business model, we wanted to tackle the three biggest pain points that we found in composting, which is People think it's not easy, they don't think it's convenient, and they think it smells. Let's be real. Uh, so we wanted to address those three things, and our hypothesis was, if we did that, people will compost. Um, and 10 years later, I think we're right. Um, our members have diverted over 29 million pounds of compostables from the landfill, uh, which has created about 9 million pounds of nutrient-rich comp nutrient compost for local use. Um, so again, with our business model, we make it really easy because we do it for you. Um, you put your compostables in a bin, very, very easy. Um, we make it convenient. You just put it outside your front door um, and we'll come and get it. And we make it clean um, because again, you're not dealing with uh, the actual process. Um, and I wanna give a shout out to Brooks Contractor. Um, they actually subcontract sub us out for a lot of the, um, uh, 
uh, roles that we play within the Orange County Waste. So we do help about 30 restaurants and churches and, and other kind of organizations compost in Orange County. Um, so we kind of act as the middleman, we're the haulers. Uh, I like to say that we're the connectors, we're connecting the people that produce compostables with the people who are processing the compostables. Um, so we do a lot of the hauling uh, in the triangle. So again, wanted to big, do a big shout out to um, Orange County. You guys are doing a great job with your program and Brooks. Um, Y'all, there's not a lot of commercial facilities in North Carolina, sadly. So we must support them because they're so important in this fight for um, making composting uh, a more norm. And that's all I got. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Taylor from the Office of Waste Reduction and Recycling at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, would you like to share with us? Um, sure. <laughs> Um, so hey everyone, I'm a senior at UNC studying environmental science. I am an intern with the Office of Waste Reduction and Recycling. Um, I work mainly with the residence halls with the Green Gains program, um, but I just want to chat about like res hall composting. Um, we started our program in 2014 with about four different residence halls as like a pilot program and it's grown to all of the residence halls on campus. Um, similar to, I think Blair or Kira's presentation, our, our data is a little lagged up from, uh, from COVID stuff. So in the 2018, 2019 year, we composted about 2.2 tons um, on campus. We have different um, uh, events and programs to support composting and we give bins to all the students who live in the residence halls. They can pick them up at their community office and then they can compost in their room and then take it out to the bins that are placed right next to the recycling, um, the cardboard dumpsters and the normal garbage dumpsters. Um, I don't know what else to say really. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's what we do here at UNC, so. And then um, Charlotte, who lives in the North Side community, um, could you talk to us real quick about your um, experience with composting? Yeah, thank you. And um, it's such a pleasure to, to be listening to all of you guys. I'm already learning so much. Um, I'm an absolute newbie to all of this. Um, I'm a student at UNC. I major in computer science. Um, and so I started, so I've always grown up composting. My mom did it and I always like, didn't really understand the value of it um, until much later after moving out. I actually participate in the residence hall composting program, which was cool. And, um, and now I'm living in a house um, in the, the North side. And um, I got introduced to permaculture and that's how I got more interested in composting and gardening, combining with that. Um, I've tried some like other alternatives that are maybe for small spaces like vermic uh, composting or other ways of doing it. But um, the setup I have now is super, super easy. And um, if nothing else, I think I'm just evidence that it, how easy it is. Um, and so, oh yeah. Okay, so these are pictures of the setup I have. It's a very humble setup. Um, so just take this to know that how easy it is. These are pallets that I uh, got off campus where they were gonna be recycled and just cut them in half and nail them together. Um, and so, yeah, all it is is a pile of leaves. And when you take scraps from your house or that we finished my, me and my roommates, um, we just throw it in there, cover it with leaves and uh, just leave it. And so I also have a small garden that I just put. So last semester when the compost finished, uh, wasn't actually all the way done processing, but um, I just put it in the bottom. And so one of the things is like, <laughs> I would emphasize is that um, there's, there's like no risk of trying to compost. The worst thing that can happen if it's too bad, you can just bury it in the ground. Um, and if you have a garden, um, for instance, what I do, I don't have the highest quality compost. I don't really know how to do it perfectly. And I don't have a lot of time and energy. And so I might put it in as a layer into my garden, um, just add nutrients to the soil or um, a local homestead and say, hey, do you need any compost that you can add in? Um, and it's a fun learning experience, I think. Um, I've learned a lot while doing it. For instance, don't try to compost with Bradford pear leaves. That's a bad idea. And um, there's some other things that you know you learn along the way and it's been really fun. Um, if you're interested in on a personal level, I 
I read Let It Rot and Gaia's Garden, which are two great books to get introduced to it. And also the, the Reddit community on composting has been very helpful because you can just like post like, I have these bugs or I have, and if it's like smelly, it's not supposed to be smelly. So if it's smelly, you're doing it wrong is what I learned. And so um, you can always post, I have this situation and somebody will help you out. Um, so yeah, if nothing else, um, it's easy, give it a try. And again, the worst thing that can happen is you just put it in the ground and then there's a little bit more nutrients in the ground. So yeah, that's all for me. Thank you so much. I might have to get on Reddit because we compost and it kind of smells. <laughs> so I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> it's okay, we'll figure it out. Um, so yeah, next we wanted to ask a few questions that were directed at um, kind of specific groups to kind of get into more details. Um, so our first one was um, at the university representative. Um, so Taylor, um, how can students compost? I mean, you kind of talked about this a little on and in off campus apartments, um, like what resources exist for that? Yeah, well, aside from our residence hall composting, we also have composting in all the dining halls and a couple other um, cafes and such around campus. So if you're eating at Lenore or you're well at the top of Lenore during a normal semester, when they take the plates, they'll put the compost out back of house and when you're downstairs at Lenore, a lot of the packaging is compostable. So you can just compost all that and not have to carry it to your dorm room. Um, aside from that, obviously, res hall composting. So if you have like banana peels or you live in Rams, um, Ram Village apartments and you're cooking in your kitchen, you can just put those in the little bin that they give you. It's like probably this big. It fits in your fridge. It stays cool. It doesn't smell. And then you just take it out when you take out like your recycling or your trash. Um, I mean, I live off campus now, so I could tell you how I compost, but I feel like that would be taking away from some of the other people that are here to talk about off campus. Um, personally, I used to take it to the farmer's market, but now I use the um, UNC Compost Mates um, organization and they pick up compost from students who live off campus. So that's normally what I do. I would suggest that like, talking to Orange County people the most if you live off campus about it, so. Um, and so we also wanna make it clear that um, if anyone in the audience has any questions that they'd like to ask, um, just you can raise your virtual hand or you can put it in the chat. Um, I have a question for Kat from Compost Now. I want to know how do your facilities work um, for composting? Do you like use the anaerobic or the aerobic composting like Blair was talking about? Um, how do they work? Sure. So in the triangle, we act as haulers. So we don't own our own facility. What we do is we collect from all of our members, aggregate it all into at our warehouse in Raleigh. And then we partner with Brooks who comes and collects it every week uh, to, to process it in Goldston at their facility. However, we do co-own a facility in Atlanta called King of Crops. Um, and we do, it's an on-farm mid-scale permitted facility and we use windrows for that system. Very interesting. Um, and then we can go on to businesses. So um, Karen and Linda, um, also Greg, I know you guys both kind of are in that. So um, whichever. Um, from your experience, what are the biggest barriers that businesses face when it comes to initiating composting programs? Um, well, am I muted here? I'm probably, no, I am muted. Um, you know, I, I think it's just a little intimidating to people to think about it. And in restaurants, especially, you know, as I said before, time and space are very important. You, you don't want to delay anything that you're doing. You, you think it's going to get in the way of getting the food out or clearing tables or having turnover, but that's not the case. If you set it up correctly, it's, it's very efficient. Um, the, the only excuse I could think of for restaurants is space. If you don't have, a, we always have a compound at our restaurants where we have a dumpster, cardboard recycling, um, so we always plan that and we've been able to do that since we started working with Blair on, on doing food waste recycling. So yeah, it's, it's really not that difficult. It really isn't hard. We found it was very easy to do. 
we can tag on to uh, Greg, one of the things that when we we're at least at Spotted Dog, the, the reason, one of the reasons we had to divert waste was a uh, space issue. I don't know if you're familiar with Carborough, but we didn't have a dumpster. We had three rollout carts. We had uh, two recycling bins and we didn't know, you know, and, and it only got picked up two times a week. So we're like, what in the world are we going to do? And, you know, with the organics waste. And so, you know, we, we survived for 18 years with basically having two, three trash cans, you know, regular or landfill trash uh, picked up twice, you know, twice a week. Um, and the rest of it was, you know, organics, uh, that, um, food waste and things like that, because we had nowhere to put it. You know, we didn't, you know, we hauled off the, we had to haul off, um, you know, cardboard and things like that, because there was just no space. We were literally like on an Island on those. So uh, to say it forced our hand is a good thing because it really did sort of get it into this. And so it's always been like a, a way, a spotted dog way, the a way that we've always done it, um, almost from the beginning, um, just a quick add on being at a from Binkley, which is a faith organization, one of our biggest challenges, and it will always be a challenge, which is, and I'm telling you this because you have to have patience from day one and you have to have patience until the very end, is that our community is always changing. Our people are always changing. And we have what we call user groups, which are like 12 step groups, of community groups, the Kiwanis clubs, things like that. Their membership is always changing. So every single week at Binkley, we have new faces. Um, and so for us, it's a constant challenge. And we just say that with a smile. So we're constantly educating. And if you really look at that as an opportunity versus as not a good thing, but as a positive, we always have the opportunity to effect change and to teach people. And what we've learned as a positive is they take that out into their own personal communities or their work communities or their families and they teach. And so we feel like it has this growing snowball effect. And so that you teach one person, they teach 10 and they teach 10. And suddenly the whole community knows a lot more. But that's been our biggest challenge at a faith group is that our, our people always change. That actually like to... ties very nicely um, into our next question. Sorry, Blair, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, I wanted to um, add something to what Greg had to say that I think is really uh, significant. If you were in the back of the house at 411 West, the system that they set up, you know, integrated into their service plan enabled the people that bust the tables to very quickly scrape off the food waste and there was a waiting table. There were all these little nuances that make it probably more efficient and better. And also it doesn't burden the dish machine itself with all that food waste. So the dishwasher is very grateful for that. So this, the whole thing kind of really works together as a system when you, when you do it right. And, and people that try to swim against the tide and look at this as a burden, just um, if they were ever invited to be in the back of the house at 411, as Kat probably was, uh, you'll see how smoothly it works and how well, if it's properly designed in the first place. Um, I actually use it as a teaching example. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to uh, respond to a question in the chat about biodegradable utensils, if I might, um, from, from Charlotte. Um, First, I want to make the semantic, important semantic distinction between compostable, biodegradable, and degradable. So you only want to compost things that say compostable. That's a, not just a term of art anymore, but thanks to the Federal Trade Commission, it's a regulated term. So you, can't, you can no longer say under penalty of law, something is compostable if it's not. So when you buy the stuff, you want to buy the ones that are compostable and certified. There's a group called the Bioproducts Institute BPA that um, is sort of like the good housekeeping seal of approval for compostable stuff. And so when you see the, the green band around some of the corn cups and so on, uh, you can be sure that they will in fact degrade and become compostable. Sometimes people make these utensils and it's a fake out. They say compostable, but Amy Brooks will tell you after it's sat in her compost for 18 months, it's screened out as a recognizable fork when she's screening that stuff to make her beautiful compost. So uh, there, there, I just wanted to react to a couple of those um, points that came up earlier in the conversation. Um, and I, I did want to say regarding Orange County's funding of what we do, there's a solid waste programs fee that is assessed to every front door in the county, if you will, um, 
whether you're a, a, a one room mobile home or whether you're a, you know, a 10,000 square foot Walmart, or I mean, a 100,000 square foot Walmart, you get a solid waste programs fee and everybody in between that supports most of the work we do. So we're able to turn around and finance uh, a lot of progressive forward looking uh, approaches. But what really undergirds that again, as the the fact that the towns and the county have committed early on and, and reiterated over the years that, that one, of, one of our policy goals as governmental organizations is to reduce the amount of waste that we make. So that, you know, when people point at me and say that I did a great job, it's there, there are these factors that really keep us going um, in both financially and policy wise. Taylor, do you have anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add on. Um, Blair is completely right about biodegradable versus compostable. Like BPI certified compostable is what is compostable. Um, at the dining halls, though, they will say compostable and they are. So don't worry. <laughs> they are made to be compostable. Um, it's more, you should be more wary when it's like, a restaurant with to-go orders and you're just looking at it really quickly or it's like buying for an event or something. So those ones you have to like look more closely, but BPI certified compostable is compostable in, um, <laughs> in um, compostable like industrial composting facilities. Um, I would not suggest putting it in your backyard compost, but, like compost pile because they're kind of hard to degrade compared to in a industrial one where they have the heat and like turning capacities that can like break it down but compostable in um industrial places like brooks so um thank you um so going back to what um karen and linda were talking about regarding education um, fostering awareness is obviously a big part of increasing participation in composting programs. Um, so how do you integrate environmental education into church programming? Um, well, we've had um, at, at, our, at, at Binkley, we've had lots of um, uh, Earth Day is a big one. That's when we, we launched our um, Proclamation of Sustainability in 2018. Um, you know, through our work 2018, uh, we were recognized by the Interfaith Power and Light. Um, we received a Cool Congregations Award, um, which we were able to sort of, you know, bring before the congregation. Um, we, we have um, what we call Eco Sundays, we, where we have a table and, and uh, we collect hard to recycle things. We have compost um, education. Uh, one year we did a each month had a different theme for that compo. I mean, for that eco Sunday, um, like Plastic Free July, things like that. So we always try to keep it at least at Binkley, and that's what we encourage other congregations to do: is to keep it constant. Meaning, you're always there's always a conversation that you could that you could have. Uh, we try to get youth involved. We try to get kids in involved. Um, you know, we had Muriel come out and do a thing at Vacation Bible School on vermicomposting. We did. Um, waste aversion thing at, at Bible school. So any opportunity that we, you know, that we can, we try to, you know, without really getting, having them get annoyed, we, we really do try to keep it constant. Um, fellowship uh, gatherings, things like that. There's a church produces a lot of food waste. And so, you know, to that education, education, um, that we, we just always kept it at the forefront. At least we try to. We also have a monthly newsletter, um, kind of like what Orange County does. And in that for an entire year, we would write a column that was that was called the green corner. And we continue to do that, especially around holidays and other events that, that you see a lot of, uh, waste production. Um, and then we go to speak to any organization that lets us go speak, or we work with any group. We've worked with the Chapel Hill Historical Society. And we've been to several churches around um, the whole triangle area uh, to share some of the information that we've shared with our own congregation. That's yeah. awesome. I love that you guys have a column. <laughs> um, I wanna to touch on something real quick. Um, 
I would say, uh, I've kind of learned three things uh, regarding ed education composting programs. I would say one is design it to be successful. Um, set it up just like 411, set it up for success from the jump um, and really rely on whoever's providing the service or whoever you're um, kind of coordinating with to lean on them. Um, two, train the trainers. Um, just like Greg was saying, there's a lot of over, there's a lot of uh, turnover in restaurants and other kind of organizations where you're not every single person is going to be aware. So train the people who are the constants. We call them the compost champions. I used to go to schools every semester, the same schools, because it was new kids until I figured out I need to just teach the teachers <laughs> and let them be the champions and let them grow in their knowledge. And then third, start small. Um, I think a lot of people have this mentality of all or nothing. If I can't compost everything, I'm just not going to compost any of it. Um, no, we always like to start with programs really small, one cart or one bin. Um, grow from there, get your knowledge, get confident, compost confident, I, I like to say. Um, so I just wanted to share the three things that I kind of learned um, at Compost Now. So I have, thank you for sharing that, Kat. That was um, really great. Um, so I have a question for Greg. Um, so what would you say to small businesses that don't think that they can afford to invest the money and time and employee training that it takes to start up a composting program? Well, just give it a shot. You know, I mean, it's, it's not going to... It's not going to take that much time. It's not going to take any money to do it. Um, you know, give it a try. You know, Blair first approached us about doing food recycling, food waste recycling. He approached us about diverting our oyster shells, which we used to put in the dumpster. And we started hauling them for a couple of years. I used to take my truck and take our oyster shells from Squids, take them to Tom Robinson's. He would take them back down to the coast. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit of effort, but just give it a shot and you if you care, you know, we live in a world of limited resources. So if you care about where you live and the kind of life you're going to live, give some effort. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on was, you know, we've been using compostable and biodegradable stuff at the restaurants for to-go stuff. This is not answering your question now. I'm through with that. But uh, I talked to Blair, I called Blair the other day because I'm concerned that a lot of our customers aren't doing the right thing with stuff that's made out of cornstarch and uh, cane sugar, you know, that's supposed to be compostable. If it's not being put into compost, unfortunately it's going into the landfill or unfortunately it's going into recycling. And it causes problems on the recycling end because it pollutes the stream and it causes problems in the landfill because if people aren't composting this, then it's producing more methane, methane gas. So our hearts are in the right place on this. But what I asked Blair, and it was a sincere question, and I really want to do right. Our company really wants to do the right thing. We always have. Um, but the question is, should we go back to using recyclable stuff instead of depending on the customer to realize, or you know, we let people know that it's compostable. But if they're not doing the right thing with it, we're not helping solve the problem we're actually contributing to it so one thing i wanted to you know just point out to folks is sometimes it might be better and this is what i was talking to blair about maybe it's better if we use recyclable stuff because we feel the chances are a lot better people re will recycle stuff rather than counting on them to do the right thing and you know take it out to the farmer's market or take it out to the landfill um, to the recycling center and put it in the compost bin maybe what we should be doing is is using recyclable stuff so people recognize oh this is aluminum this is plastic we need to do the recycling with this um it's kind of a question i have for some of the folks on the panel um and anyone that's watching is we're kind of torn on what to do with this because we want to do the right thing and we we felt like we were doing the right thing but now we're kind of going are we doing the right thing here if people aren't doing what they're supposed to do with what we're you know and we pay more for those it's more expensive to buy compostable stuff and biodegradable stuff for to-go stuff. And, you know, during the last year with COVID, our to-go business has been astronomically better, bigger than it, it has ever been. So, you know, every time I watch these containers going out the door and I'm just like, man, I hope people are doing the right thing with this. But I, in my heart, I feel like it's not happening. And that's a little discouraging because we're trying to do the right thing. 
Blair, I, I'm I'm curious what your response is because I may have a different one. So I want you to go first. <laughs> All right, throw down, why don't you? Then we're go. good. Yes, I'm I'm happy to uh, respond to that since I had this conversation with Greg the other day, and um, I love that you know over the twenty uh, uh, no going on thirty years that I've known the guy that he's always been engaged with uh, uh, interest in doing the right thing and and so on. So um, part of the reason just to sidebar when Greg says you know we've always been interested in doing the right thing the Chapel Hill restaurant group is uh, by any measure pretty successful and so doing doing well by doing good is a, is a nice hallmark to, to have um, and in, in response to that yeah this is a conundrum that goes on and on and um, the best thing you can do of course when you do a takeout order is say you know i'm taking that food home i don't need your plastic fork i don't need your straw etc you know i don't even need but one paper napkin say um so to start with reducing uh, whatever your order is and and urging the restaurants as the chapel restaurant group does to make that part of their program and then uh, secondly i think it's kind of all over the place so let's say that you get one of these aluminum pie pan type takeout containers with a with a, a clear plastic hat on it. So yeah, if you want to go to the trouble of rinsing out that aluminum pie pan, uh, depending on where your program is um, and, and who your collector, uh, who your processor is for recycling, even that aluminum pie pan, you might still have to drag that to scrap metal at one of the recycling sites. Uh, not, you know, not to rain on anybody's parade here, but we were told by our processor for recyclables that they don't want foil and pie pans in there anymore. So, you know, then the, the top of those um, is very often a polystyrene, which we don't have good recycling markets for here. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a there's not um, a lot of latitude in doing the right thing when it comes to takeout. There's some. I've got soup containers that are just HDPE, high density polyethylene tubs. Those are fine. Um, you know, of course, if you're getting a styrofoam polystyrene one, they're not fine. And it's it's extremely difficult to go through this process and um, end up, you know, spending more and not really having a, a good solution uh, to the problem. And there's a professor at NC State, Mort Barlas, who's done some of the work on uh, the, the, uh, the 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 compostable stuff and ending up in landfills and generating methane. So I'm following his lead when I cite the uh, the little bit of science that's been done on that. And and I'll turn it back to you, Kat, because you said you may have a different response than I do. I think we're aligned. Um, I think a couple of points just to talk on the other side is. As a society, we have to get away from fossil fuel products, right? Like we must, as a society, start building a circular economy. And unfortunately, right now, it is more expensive to buy compostable material. However, if you're supporting those kinds of systems and, and those kinds of programs, um, I think it can only improve and get better. Um, so that's one of my pitches is, hey, that's the future we wanna build. Though, in my opinion, it should always be reusable. That's what I wanna work towards. But in the interim, um, I do wanna get away from fossil fuel products, right? Second would be, um, they do take less resources to make as a whole. That's just, I'll leave, I'll leave that. Um, and then three, even if not everybody's composting it, you're still giving them the opportunity to, which I think is important um, of not making the decision for them and may, maybe being, a, I don't know, giving the benefit of the doubt though, I get it, I'm a composter, we, we don't recover a ton. Um, but I will say the recycling industry isn't doing too hot right now, as I'm sure you guys have read in the last two years. So it's kind of, it's, it's a really hard, um, it's a really hard discussion, but I'm glad we're having it because um, I think I think it's really important to figure out a way to build a more circular economy with those kind of single use products. I love that response. Oh, thanks, Blair. Sounds good. Yeah. Right. No, I, I I'm I'm not being sar sarcastic at all. I'm I'm genuine. No, I know. I know. How we, how we do how we do turn the ship matters, and um, you know uh, this whole sort of life cycle analysis debate and and Kat may frankly be more informed than I am about saying that it takes less resources on the front end to produce the compostable item. So, 
you know, uh, there, there's a there's a good conversation to be had here, uh, and and I guess um, <clears throat> I, I'd ask Greg uh, if he has a lot of repeat customers, if there's any possibility whatsoever that oh, you guys have compost there at Squids and 411. Is there any capacity to take back any of their compostable utensils uh, and and take out containers if they were to do that? Well, there might be. Um... You know, then you get into, I mean, Kat, you realize this, you work at 411 when it gets busy. I mean, every second counts. Um, you know, ideally what we do is people would bring in containers and they would order food and we would put it in their containers and there wouldn't be any waste from that. They'd take it home and eat the food, wash it, bring it back again. That can't happen. There's no way that can happen. Um, you know, would we be able to accept compostable stuff back? Yeah, probably. Yeah, we could do that. Um, you know, it's another one of those things where it sounds intimidating, but if we tried to do it, probably could. Um, then you get into educating customers and getting into that whole other, you know, turning that page and saying, okay, now we have to teach our customers to do this and this. And some people will buy into that. Um, you know, what we're always afraid of is, is that gonna, is that gonna, is that gonna cause us to lose that customer? You know, if we're asking them to do that, if we're making a big deal about this, I'd like to think that everyone cares as much as the people on this panel do <laughs> and the people that are tuned in to listen to this. But we all know that's not the case. Um, you know, we're still a business. We're, we're a for-profit business. And I've had discussions with my managers and my chefs and my partners about we have to do this. You know, we have to do the right thing. And they all agree with it. They all don't, I don't get a lot of argument with it, but at some point we're a business and we have to think about, okay, what makes sense here? Does it make sense to give people this compostable stuff and then ask them to bring it back? And will they do that? And if they do, we can find space to put it there, but I, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big ask. That's what I would say. I just thought I'd but put it out there. Yeah. Well, I put it out there. No, so, we talked uh, about it the other day, and I, I understood it then, and I understood it. I understand it now. Um, right. Yeah, we, right. we, we um, want to do what we can to help, but I, I get back to that thing where if they're not doing the right thing with the compostable stuff, are we causing more of a problem in the landfill than we are if we use recyclable stuff? And as Kat pointed out, the recyclable uh, business isn't great right now either. So, you know. There's no simple answer. Let me it's jump in on that. Problem. Let me jump in on that particular point and say for the first time in two years, we're poised to get a check from our recycling processor because the market has seen a bit of an uptick. So all those cardboard Next. boxes, all those cardboard boxes that Amazon needs has caused the price of cardboard to, to, to pull the whole recycling stream up. And when oil like all their vans drive up and down every street in the country. And yeah, produce right. carbon waste. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I see a question here from Charlotte about methane biogas energy generators does not have any effect on whether we should worry about food waste and landfills. So I want to respond real quickly to that because earlier on I said trying to get methane that way is like taking the cream out of the coffee. So yeah, it's it's better than it was and it is uh, part of the regulatory process now. If you're closing a landfill, you have to do this by uh, federal law and so on. And um, Yet uh, it's still expensive, and um, the whole uh, sort of house of cards of, of the economics is built on tax credits and um, renewable energy credits and so on for making landfill gas. So uh, it's not a bad thing, especially now that landfills are capped at the top and the bottom. So the gas is sort of sealed in there, but it's not it's not a real efficient way to get at food waste. Um, and there's still a lot of unlined landfills like the north half of our landfill is 45 acres of unlined landfill. So even though we're pulling gas out of that as quickly as we can um, without pulling oxygen through it, it's still, there's an awful lot of methane going into the atmosphere. And so in the net, uh, they reckon it at 15% of all the methane emissions from human activity are from landfills. Um, so we're running a little short on time, which is, I mean, better than the opposite. We're talking a lot, so that's good. Um, I have a few questions for Charlotte. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you have limited time. Um, so kind of on that note, how much time do you spend with upkeep? Um, what does upkeep look like in a backyard setting? Um, and just like how long does it take generally for your compost to break down? Do 
yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so in terms of upkeep and managing it, I'd say the most time spent was just putting it together, which took like two hours. And then um, it's about as much time as it takes to take out the trash. Um, so it's like walking into the backyard, throwing it in and covering it with leaves. Um, so not much time at all. There's no lack of leaves as well. Um, and then as, in terms of how long it takes, um, as you might've seen in the picture, I have two different, and, and people have like sometimes a three bin system um, because you wanna let one pile break down while you're contributing to the other. And so it depends on a couple factors like the ratios of greens to browns and also how warm it is. If you put compost, compost out in the winter, it's gonna take a lot longer than it will in the summer. Um, and so I'm, I think it depends on a lot of those factors, but I would say, I think like six months to a year, um, probably more towards a year to two years if you want high quality compost. But also, like I said, if you're like me, I'm living in this house for a year. So waiting six months and then adding that compost to the soil as an amendment um, and not as like pure compost, that can always be done as well. Charlotte, do you turn your compost or do you just have it in those bins? Yeah, I turn it weekly. I just move it. So I don't, some people like take it, all their compost out and move it to a different location and move it back. I just literally turn it over. I have a shovel next to it and I do that a week. And if you forget, it, it's not the end of the world. And if you. That's. Oh, I think she's frozen. Um, she's Elsa. <laughs> I might be back. Sorry. I'm moving locations. Okay. Yeah. Was there a question or? Oh, no, we, you just cut out for a little bit there at the end. Oh, um, I was just saying, were you asking about turning the compost? I was just saying that I turn it about once a week by just using a shovel to move it around. And sometimes I forget about it for two weeks and sometimes I'm hypervigilant and both of those are fine. So yeah, super easy. Awesome. Yeah, the so, watchword is that compost happens. Yes, yes. If you just leave it alone, it will really be fine. Yeah, it's, it's doing what it wants to be doing. So we want to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time and that we finish off at eight. Um, but before that, um, my friend Kara, who is the director of sustainable projects for the Residence Hall Association at UNC, um, she brought up a very good point that um, it's very important to prevent this waste from happening um, in the first place um, and that composting and recycling are tools that we have to sort of divert our waste. Um, so I was wondering if any of you folks on the panel want to jump in on um, ways that you recommend for reducing waste at its source um, and to cut down on having the waste to begin with. Yeah, I could chat about that since I've been in this really great geography class that I work with my professor and she has a farm and she's having us like think about all these things a lot more. And for one of my assignments, I kind of just looked at like, what food waste am I producing and how can I kind of cut that as much as possible? So I went and did an inventory of all of the stuff in my kitchen, <laughs> um, which you totally don't have to do. You just need to know kind of like what you have so that you're using already what you have instead of buying more things and not using them. Um, and just like being kind of, cautious, not cautious, but like thinking about what you're buying when you're getting food and not buying a ton of stuff that you're not going to eat and thinking about how you're actually going to use it. Cause I've had a lot of problems in the past, just buying something when I see it and I'm like, Oh, I can make that into this. And then I like forget about it. And it's a week later and it's rotted. And I'm like, I guess I got to compost it now. So I think it's just kind of having a lot more intent on what you're doing and looking at things in your the circles that are in your life and how you can close them, how you can kind of just look at what you already have and use that instead. I think it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy too at the restaurants because we found um, 
Absolutely, that when people are seeing the waste that they're producing with food, it has an impact on them. And they're trying to, we found that people, our prep people especially, started looking a little more closely at what they were doing with every piece of food that they were working with. You know, could they get another half inch out of that carrot? Could they get another slice out of that onion? It, it worked, you know, and if, if people see what they're working with and see the waste that they're producing, I think that has an impact. I really do. And shout out to Chapel Hill Restaurant Group. And I'm going to ask Greg to detail some of their decision making about um, not offering, not automatically putting throwaway utensils in the takeout. How'd that work out for you all? Oh, it hasn't been a problem at all. You know, I, when Blair and I talked about it, when he approached me about cutting back on that, especially with, with once again, with the pandemic and so much to go business, um, so much more than we're used to doing. Um, I went to talk to my GMs and what I found was they all were saying, we're not giving people to go silverware. You know, we, we, if we do it with a delivery service, it's being delivered to someone's home, so they don't need it. Um, if unless they ask for it, or, I mean, they have to directly ask for it and we might mention it to them, but we don't, we just decided early on, I mean, literally 10 months ago to say, we're not giving to go silverware because people are calling it silverware is ridiculous anyway, but you know, <laughs> there's just, it's, it's so wasteful and so stupid to do it. And it's, it, it's costly, you know, everything's bottom line with us. So, uh, and we, I, I remember one time I had a GM tell me that a woman said she would never come back to Squids, but she got it, she got it to go order and it didn't have to go silverware and she didn't have anything to eat with. So she was upset, um, but that's one out of <laughs> 200,000 to go orders that we've done over the past year or whatever it's been. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take that shot, but uh you know, we, we try to think about everything we put in every bag and everything we put on every plate and everything that we we have going into the waste, uh, you know, what's going to the landfill, what's going to be recycled. Um, uh, you know, sometimes you just pay that price. But uh, no, we didn't we didn't worry about it from the get go. It was like this stuff's expensive. It's not being used. It's stupid to put it in the bag. So don't do it to answer your question, Blair. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for um, coming here and thank you to all of our panelists for speaking and sharing so much information with us. Um, this recording will be posted to the Sustain Chapel Hill website, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but thank you all for coming today. Um, this was just a very incredible and wonderful conversation. Yeah, and special thanks to all of our panelists. It was really great to meet you all and uh, learn a lot from you all. Thank you. Everyone have a Carry great, on, great night. Thank you. Happy, happy Earth Week. <laughs>